exist, and that was pretty much what like created it. That was the scientific excuse for it. Uh, so I don't think anyone here took that class with me, but that was like probably early 1900s, maybe. Um, so that was a you know a while ago, and they you know they even um, scientists and anthropologists back then had released um, statements saying that the a just for lack of, just for use of the word, um, that the Negro soul was different and that bones were different and that their bodies were different, therefore they were a different species, not to be considered human. And that is, to my understanding, to what I learned from that class, what started the majority of racism that we see on a daily basis. Anyone else have a thought on why in America or basically in our global society, it is normal to think of or to dehumanize black bodies um, in that way. Anybody understand why we would hold on to such a myth? It, or would all the scientists in the world continue to believe or perpetuate something like that? Do you see any responses in that? Do you realize that that's for economic gain? Anyone? We have a lot of politicians and a lot of the basic people that are in the leadership of social justice movements, of policy, um, that are still white, like very privileged. And as a black woman, that someone who knows their history, who understands the systemic discrimination and the value of building economic basis from the discrimination instead of getting rid of the discrimination, um, I'm always wondering, why, if we know that we're being miseducated, if we know that we've been misinformed, if we know that we're dehumanizing society just so that we can have these social values and in industry um, where we have a patriarchy and that defines what role you play in society, um, why as minorities and why as minority allies, and I, and I don't even know why I'm using the word minority, because to me it seems as if it's like a minor priority, right? Like, okay, the minority is not as major or necessary as the priority person. So let's say that people that have alliances with minor priority people, um, you also have to realize that you have a privilege that we don't. Um, when we speak out against these aggressions, people tend to say that we're being uh, defensive or they want to lack, um, they want to devalue the statements that are being made or they want to reprimand by saying that it's an implicit bias. And my thought is that with the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and the civil liberties that we have in the function of being able to uh, file a complaint against the discriminatory act, that our lack of doing that 
has created a lack of value in who we are. It's keep us on a level of dehumanization because if there's no consideration in our contract that says that people are complaining about this being discriminated against, they're just dealing with it, then that means that there's really not a problem. But then again, when we protest and we say, hey, stop killing us or don't take my child or you know, fuck the police because I'm tired of them abusing me or I believe that the state system is set up against me. When we speak those things out, when women speak them out, when children speak them out, you have to understand that it takes a lot of courage to actually bring that up when in fact the world's order is around the oppression of your body. And so when we talk about the education that you're receiving, um, I remember when my kids were younger and they kept saying, why am I learning math? It's not gonna help me, mom. I'm not gonna need math when I become an artist. And I was like, yeah, you are, you're gonna be starving. Um, my son said, I don't need spelling, I don't need spelling. What am I gonna have to write when I get older? You're gonna apply that knowledge to change something in your world in order to change your life. Um, but when you're in school right now, when I, when I talk about bystander intervention, it's saying that right now, the statements that you make, the thoughts that you have, the programs that you want and you desire to create in the world, whether it's through your art, whether it's through your writing, whether it's through whatever industry you want to be in, um, those are appropriate values that are going to help us change and shift culture. But we have to be mindful that patriarchy and the systemic systems that are in place don't want that change to happen, but this is an appropriate time to make the change. And um, we don't have to wait until leaders are martyred to speak out about things that are uh, dehumanizing. Uh, we don't have to wait until a movement happens because that's at the, at the death of someone. Um, we need to do those things now and in our day, daily lives. Um, the reason that I brought this exhibition here is because I'm an active organizer. I'm an active activist in the Black Lives Matter movement. My nephew was murdered on September 26th of 2010. And when he was murdered, he was a part of a group of organized uh, policing partners that have been identifying him and all of his friends since early childhood education as wraparound partners. But the fact of the matter is that most of him and his friends were all murdered in gang violence, in community violence, by police brutality. And so in my mind, as somebody that's looking at these trends, it kind of makes no sense to me that those same agents and state partners will continue having the mandates over the children's education. So my hope is that this generation and the work that I'm doing and the work that's been happening over the next eight years, that it creates a different conformity um, where you're, you're just, it's normal, it's usual and customary to call things out. It's usual and customary to dismantle and to intervene on these systems. Um, it's usual and customary to hear that these things are happening and to do more research so that you can further your education because we should be instituted to change. I'm thinking like, I never thought to do the same things that my mom did when she was a kid. I didn't want to dress like her. I didn't want to listen to the same music. I wasn't into the same culture because it was corny by the time I was born, right? By the time she was 21 years old and had me and all that stuff, everything that she did when she was a child, the stuff that her grandparents did, that wasn't cool anymore. But we continued to comply with systems that were made before any of us and any of our parents were born, and they were made based on a racist system. So, um, so just being mindful and being aware of these things and having the discussions in the classrooms shouldn't be the end of it. Um, let's say that since I started protesting, I used to work for an accountant. When I started protesting, um, it was, again, in response to my nephew, and most of the people in power kept saying that the children were being murdered in gang violence and all this stuff was happening because we lacked resources. Uh, one success that I can tell you that from the time that I started speaking out, the time that I started going to the state capitol, the time that I started becoming politically engaged in things, so many hundreds of millions of dollars of resources, and I'm watching this happen across the nation because there's a lot of people pushing movements. There's hundreds of thousands of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars, mind you, um, to make systemic change. But there's not a lot of people charging to use those changes. So, for example, earlier today for the 
bystander intervention training, a biology teacher came in and she has, they spoke to me and she said, well, when I think about intervention, I think about a time when I was in a program where we were trying to facilitate biology program outreach for our marginalized community members. But when it came time to build the program after we got the funding, we didn't know where they were. We didn't make a plan to reach out to them. So we utilized the students that we had. And every year, that's basically how we promote our, our campaign because we keep getting the funding. We still have the need for this outreach and we're utilizing our own students instead of doing direct outreach. And she said she, she questioned that and she even argued against it but the people that had the proprietary knowledge of where to get the money, where to get the funds, how to incorporate that into the program at the schools, um, they were so used to having it go that way that they said, let it go. Well, I told her, I said, if you write an opinion editorial today, it might have not worked four years ago or two years ago, but if you write it now and you do a call to action to industry and you say, if you're instituting these type of outreach programs and you're not facilitating a direct connection with the marginalized communities that they're meant for, then you're doing the wrong thing. I said, call it out the same way we're calling out on the Me Too movement. Call it out on the same way that we're talking about wage gaps. Call it out, because right now, because of so many children that have died, because of so many women that are speaking out, because of so many bodies on the front line saying that they're allies, this is the perfect time to actually do something about it. And even if you're doing something that is not relative to protest, whatever you're doing, whatever institution, whatever industry you have, I bet you that policy is mandated about around a white supremacist structure. Dismantle it. Utilize the education that you're getting right now. Utilize the experiences that are happening in society right now to create something new in society. Add to it, put what you have, your perspectives on it. Because our children are inheriting this mess. I bet my great, great grandparents never thought that what was happening to them would continue to happen to their children. When the lynchings were happening, that was law enforcement and the KKK. When we're learning about some of the killer cops that are out here, they have EK under their uniforms, European kindred. When we're learning about Jeremy Christian and Russell Cordier, people that were allowed to kill on our streets, is that they had been reinforced in the prison system to push that indoctrination. And they had been protected by that same system. They didn't get murdered or beat upon being arrested. But we have children on the board that got murdered even though they didn't have any weapons. Even if they were suspected. We have videos right now that shows Marines being chased and shot in the back, and then we can still comment in these articles that he shouldn't have ran from the police. Who dictated that capital punishment against someone who has warrants, someone who hasn't paid child support, a 12-year-old child with an air rifle in a park, a seven-year-old kid on their grandparents' couch, a woman on her way to work, but missed the a light on her car didn't turn on a signal. Who, who mandated that it's okay for us as a society to make their death by the state reasonable? I can't ever imagine, I shoot good, I know how to shoot. I can't ever imagine shooting someone who's running from me. I would be the biggest coward. I would be called a murderer. That would be homicide, right? But if I'm a law enforcement officer in America, that is not homicide. Even the Supreme Court just ruled against it and said that excessive force from our officers in America, in America, this week is not founded as a problem if you murder someone. We had a sheriff announce yesterday that if you kill a suspect, it's cheaper than if you allow them to live. I can tell you that when Qantas Hayes was murdered, only one officer, Andrew Hurst, shot at him and that he was reprimanded because if the other officers do not see a threat, then you can't feel threatened. And so this past week, when the brother down, downtown Portland got murdered, several officers extinguished the force because they have to go within their training. The training states that if you guys are in fear, you have to protect one another. And we can't let the suspect live because it costs the state more money. That means that the value of life doesn't matter. The way that we indoctrinate ourselves in believing that if you do what you're supposed to do, then you will not be hurt. 
Well, the system's not talking about you. The system is saying respect society, respect